Thank you, Chris. I want to thank all of you for taking what is, I would hope, a, a free day for you, a Saturday, uh, and doing something that just not everyone always thinks of doing. And I'll get into it a little bit when I talk about divine friendship. In other words, the friendship which Jesus offers to each and every one of us specifically. And he wants us to say, yes, I will be your friend. But not everyone takes the time to come together for a period of reflection, silent reflection, before our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. Not everyone takes the time to come to Mass on a day when all of us aren't necessarily required to be at Mass and to take the time, if necessary, to go to confession. It's there that the friendship we are given by the Lord really touches each of us. So I thank you for being here. It's important. It's important for you as Catholic young women and men. It's important for your families. It's important for all of us, all who belong to the Catholic Church in the Diocese of Bismarck. So let's begin and I would like to read to you one of the places, there aren't that many, in the four Gospels where Jesus speaks specifically about his friendship with us. St. John's Gospel records this. Jesus said, this is my commandment. Love one another as I love you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down his life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I no longer call you slaves because a slave does not know what his master is doing. I have called you friends because I have told you everything I have heard from my father. It was not you who chose me, but I who chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit that will last, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. This I command you, love one another. It's a very powerful statement which Jesus makes. He's not teaching in a parable, he's speaking one-to-one, -one, so to speak. Not just with his apostles, which he was at the time, but when you and I listen to this, he is literally speaking right now to you and to me, telling us the very same thing. And for us to begin to understand the greatness 
of the gift of divine friendship is for us to begin to understand the real love which this friendship of Jesus expresses. And he says it. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. Think about that. We'll get into a little parsing, if you will, or separating out different meanings of friend or friendship. But this is what Jesus says. This is the kind of friend he is to you and to me. Pope Benedict the 16th at the time he began his pontificate in 2005 uh, at a very solemn and beautiful pontifical mass in St. Peter's Square. In his homily, he said this, there is nothing more beautiful than to be surprised by the gospel, by the encounter with Jesus. There is nothing more beautiful than to know him and to speak to others of our friendship with him. The divine friendship offered to each of us has a name. He is Jesus. In all of human history that went on before he came into the world, he was foretold and prefigured. We know that when we read the Old Testament prophets. In all of human history, since his coming into the world, he has been, is, and will always be God who is love. That's important for us. We don't always keep that in mind. We don't intentionally try and forget it. We get busy about a lot of different activities and things, and they're okay, they're good. But sometimes we forget why all those other things you and I get involved in, we do, we achieve, why is it? It's because of this. It's because it all begins with Jesus, who is our friend. Let's look at friendship. When you look in a pretty good dictionary, the terms friend or friendship are often used in conversation or the way we, we uh, seem to experience it today. Friendship more often refers to something else that we might describe as acquaintance or a classmate or a co-worker or a rather polite relationship. Or friendship can be just being civil, respectful in a particular relationship. 
Now, none of those references for friendship or being a friend, they're not wrong. They're not unhealthy. But do they really reflect the friendship Jesus has with us and what he would like us to have with him? According to one dictionary, a friend is, as it says there, one joined to another in mutual benevolence. Well, that doesn't do much for me, I can tell you. I, I don't even, I don't think I'm really dumb, but I, I have never figured out what exactly does that mean. Well, but that's what's in one dictionary. But it seems to me, and I hope to you, it's really not complete. It can identify a friend and a relationship, but doesn't mean a much. What this definition lacks can be supplied for only by the definition that the Lord Jesus himself gives to us. If you read again, or remember that passage I just read from the Gospel of St. John, it's pretty clear that the Catholic idea of friendship comes directly from the way in which Jesus himself uses that word. It's equally clear. Since Jesus is the friend to his disciples, his friendship requires something of them. They're his friends. And he even tells them, you didn't choose me, I chose you to be my friends and then to produce good fruit as my friends. That's something that only our understanding of friendship is, is obedience. Now, as soon as we hear that, we probably automatically start thinking obedience. I've got all kinds of rules, and if I don't do exactly what the rule says I'm supposed to do, I'm in trouble. Well, that's not the obedience that Jesus is talking about when he tells his friends that you are my friends if I do what I command you. The secret to understanding Jesus' friendship with us and why he wants us to do what he is asking or commanding, as he says, to do is because he set the example for us. So the obedience that Jesus is asking of his friends, namely you and me, just like everyone else, is obedience that's freely given. Yes, Lord, I will do what you command me to do because you are my friend and I am your friend. Let's think about 
this first truth. Jesus chooses us to be his friends. He says that he doesn't look at us in any other way except now we're his intimate friends so that he has given us knowledge of the Father. Every time you and I pray the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father, we're praying not only in the words that Jesus prayed himself and taught us to use, but when you pray the Our Father carefully, thinking about what you're saying, Jesus is telling us who our Father in heaven is. He's not distant or removed from us. He knows us better than we know ourselves. He's given us that most precious gift that we can have in this world, our very lives. And he's given us the greatest gift we can have in this world to prepare us to go to heaven. The gift of faith. How many in here are baptized? Okay, well, I should raise my hand, too. Yeah. How many in here have already been confirmed? How many are getting close to being confirmed? Okay. Anybody who didn't put up his or her hand, you'll be confirmed sooner than later. But the reason I ask is because when you and I were baptized, that's the first moment we became friends with God. When you and I were confirmed, which the church always tells us completes the work of baptism, you and I, who were made friends of God, are now given what Jesus says he gives to his friends. We're given the power as his friends because he chose us to be his friends. We're given the power and the mission to go and to bear fruit that will last. That good fruit, because we're the chosen friends of Jesus, is the good example that you and I set. When we're with other people, could be our family, classmates in school, people who are neighbors, live in the same area. But the good fruit that the friends of Jesus produce all begin with being like our friend, Jesus. Now, from what Jesus tells his disciples, it's pretty clear that the divine friendship isn't something you and I can earn. It's the wondrous and the mysterious gift of God to us. 
not for his sake, but for our sakes. Divine friendship is love in its purest form because it is Jesus, the Son of God. That's why I say divine friendship has a name and a face, Jesus. The divine friendship is ours not because we've asked for it, but because our friend knows we need it to fulfill the purpose of our lives. Let me give you a few examples of divine friendship. The first is probably the most profound mystery of our faith. It's not easy for us to understand. That's why it requires our faith. What the Catholic Church has believed from its very beginning and has never wavered from is that the most blessed trinity is that most basic mystery of our faith and life. It's God alone who chooses to reveal himself to us. And only he can do this. And the fact that God has chosen to do so is the first great act of divine friendship. Why speak of the most blessed trinity when we're talking about divine friendship? Because the divine friendship we're offered in baptism is the direct result of the perfect love between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this love is taken on flesh and blood in the very person of Jesus. He is the face of God. As our Holy Father, Pope Benedict, said so often, in one of his talks with priests of the Diocese of Rome, he said this, God is flesh and blood. He is one of us. We know him by his face, by his name. He is Jesus who speaks to us in the gospel. It is this love of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit which expresses itself in the creation of the universe and most especially in the creation of us human beings. In the first chapter of the book of Genesis, you know the first two chapters recount the creation of all things by God. But in the first chapter, towards the end, it says, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. God created man in his image. In the divine image, he created him male and female. And again in chapter 2, we read, The Lord God formed man out of the clay of the ground and blew into his nostrils the breath of life. And so man became a living being. We're the only ones who have been given the breath of life. 
God created every living thing and every inanimate thing in the universe. But only one creature received directly from God the breath of life, you and me. What do we learn from those passages? First, it's God who initiates friendship with us. And we, his human beings, his creatures, are the privileged recipients of it. Think of that. As much as you may like and be attached, if you have a pet, Pets are wonderful. I have one. I have a border collie. You should all have a border collie. You get a lot of exercise. Drives you crazy from time to time. But they're fun. You become attached. But guess what? As much as I'm attached to my border collie and you may be attached to your pet whatever that may be they don't have the breath of life you do I do and we received it for a reason you did not choose me but I chose you the reason is God wants us as his friends. As his friends. To trust him. To love him. To imitate in our lives him. and help others to realize they're his friends too. The second thing we learn from those chapters in Genesis is, of course, God who initiates, begins the divine friendship with each of us, never takes back his offer. We're the ones who betray our friendship with him when we commit sins. And still, God, who is our friend, doesn't as we might say today, unfriend us, whatever that means. That's, I don't, is that a word? To unfriend? Yeah. It is? Yeah. Huh. Okay. Well, God doesn't do that to you and me, even when we aren't his friends. We sin. Because he's all just and all merciful and he forgives us and restores us as his friends to himself. That's a friend. Think about in your own relationship somebody really hurts you, offends you. Perhaps your first reaction, I'm done with that person, him or her, I'll never speak to them again. Think what would happen to you if that's what God did to you. Be terrible. He doesn't do that to us. That's the kind of friend he is. 
Let's look at some real people who were the friends of God. Now, none of them are perfect. You and I aren't perfect. But yet, God chose them to be his friends and they did become his friends and did exactly what Jesus says friends of him do. They go and they bear good fruit that lasts, that's remembered, that's used by others. The first one, obviously, Adam and Eve, our first parents. God created them last because it's the sign of how important you and I are as his creatures. They're the only ones created in his image and likeness and the only ones who received the breath of life from him. You and I. They did, we did. And he entrusts all of creation to them. They're at the top because he chose them as his friends. The greatest act of divine friendship God showed to Adam was that God gave Adam his equal, Eve, his wife. And the fact that they participate in the creation of new human life proves their friendship with him. You all have heard of Noah, right? All right. There's another friend of God. In the book of Genesis, it says, Noah found favor with the Lord. Noah, a good man and blameless. In that age, he walked with God. If you read the whole story of Noah in the book of Genesis, he's God's friend precisely because it says he carried out all the commands that God gave him. He was obedient. Not because he was forced to, but because he wanted to be God's friend. And he was rewarded for that friendship. We've all heard of Abraham, the first of the patriarchs. And it said he was the friend of God. It even says that. When you read the whole story of Abraham, and it goes on for quite a while in the book of Genesis, it's really a story of, again, as Jesus says, God chose him. He didn't choose God, but God chose him to be his friend. And the story of Abraham's life is doing exactly what Jesus says his friends do. They keep his command. They are obedient. They're not doing what they want to do. That's not obedience. Real obedience is doing what we know we ought to do. Not what we want to do. Every one of these people I'm talking about as different as each one is from the other, this is what they have in common because they were chosen by God to be his friend and they said yes. And because they said yes, their lives were transformed. 
They did what they knew they ought to do. Always. Not what they wanted to do. That's important. You've all heard of, in the Old Testament, the man Joseph. One of the sons of Israel, you know, his other brothers sold, sold him into slavery, into Egypt. If you read that story, it's a magnificent story. In real terms, real life terms. How about God's friendship? Not only changes and saves the person. It changes everybody else around him. And when you read the life story of Joseph, it's to read how God, our divine friend, allows difficulties to come not as a punishment, but as opportunities for Joseph or any of us to grow in that holy obedience and patience. When we look at some of the friends in the New Testament, certain people always come to mind, and they should. But when we look at just a few, it's clear that you and I have been chosen to be his friends for the same reason he chose these people. There's no better example for any of us than the mother of God, our blessed mother Mary. She is the best example of how God chooses to befriend us and she's the very best example of how we should respond to God as his friends. Let's listen and just picture in your mind that moment when the Archangel Gabriel visits the young lady Mary. Hail, favored one. The Lord is with you. Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And she says, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. And Jesus says, You are my friends if you do what I command you. Who better to show us what that really is than our Blessed Mother? Another person is Saint Joseph, descendant of King David, He's described as the chaste spouse of the mother of God. He's called a righteous man. And in him we have the specially chosen friend of God to be the faithful guardian and provider for the son of God and his mother. 
We do not have a single word recorded of what Joseph said. And frankly, we don't need it to know why he was chosen by God to be his friend. His silent obedience to his friend's will is perhaps the greatest sermon ever preached about obedience as a friend of God. Let's look at St. John the Baptist. He's often referred to as the bridge between the Old Testament and the Age of Salvation. And the divine friendship given to him brought with it a specific vocation, a mission to be fulfilled. That's why when I asked how many have been confirmed and will be soon confirmed, because that friendship with God we are all given in baptism continues, and when we're confirmed, as his friends, as Jesus so beautifully told his own disciples, they're to go out as his friends and bear good fruit. As the friends of Jesus, we have a mission. Our mission is to live a life imitating him. If we do that, others will notice, not because it's you or me, but by imitating him, they want to know who this Jesus is. Why are you joyful? Why do you go out of your way to help someone? It's what friends do. Jesus laid down his life on the cross for us. That's going out of the way for us. That's how much a friend he is to us and he asks us do that for each other. That's what he means when he says love one another. Doesn't mean that you and I may be literally crucified. We might. We might be persecuted for being a friend of Jesus. But that's not the only way we lay down our lives. We don't ignore others who need us. We don't say, yeah, okay, I'll get back to you. It's not really convenient for me just now. Can you call me back? Friends don't do that. Friends are always there for their friends. The way Jesus is always here for you and me. And you and I know that. He is here for us. When you read the Gospels, and I urge you to do that, but do so slowly, prayerfully, and meditate, think about what you're reading. You're reading, literally, truly, about your friendship with Jesus. Allow the inspired word of God to sink in. Just don't let it 
go in one ear and out the other. Let it sink in. Let it transform you. If you do this, you're going to meet many more of those friends of God and learn from them that to be chosen for divine friendship is a life-changing experience. You'll never be the same. I guarantee it. Look at those 12 apostles. Look at Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. Look at the woman caught in the act of adultery. Look at Jairus, the synagogue official and his family and his daughter who was dead and brought to life by Jesus. Look at the centurion and his sick and dying servant. I'm naming just a few of these friends of Jesus. But before we move on, briefly let's look at three more friends, each very different, one from the other, but with whom we may be very able to identify. First is that rich young man who asked Jesus the question, the question of one's in whole life. He says, teacher, what good must I do to get to heaven, to gain eternal life? Well, we know the answer Jesus gives him. But his reaction is what is so telling. He went away sad. He couldn't say yes to the friendship of Jesus. He couldn't let go of everything else and just say yes. He had too many possessions. Divine friendship, friendship with Jesus demands of us that he be first. We're not first, he is. The second friend of God is that short little guy whose name was Zacchaeus. He was hated by everybody. He was the chief tax collector. Because he was short, he wanted to see Jesus, and of course we know how that goes. He ran far ahead and climbed up a tree so he'd get a good look at Jesus. He just wanted to see him. Now, ponder the moment divine friendship comes because he, he's looking for Jesus. St. Luke says, Jesus looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down quickly, for today I must stay at your house. He obeyed. He came down quickly. And his life was changed. One more friend. Perhaps the one most unlikely of all. The good thief. You know his name, right? St. Dismas. Consider just how being he's crucified and dying next to Jesus on Calvary. And it changed his life. And it changed his eternity. Was it blind luck that Dismas happens to be crucified next to Jesus? Not at all. Jesus, his one true friend, not only brings him to repentance, to ask for salvation, but he gets it that very day. He hears what all of us, as friends of Jesus, want to hear. Amen, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. The list goes on and on. But I urge you, 
listen to Jesus. When you're at Mass, when you're at adoration, when you're just praying alone at home, listen. What he told his disciples, he's saying to you. It's very personal. You did not choose me. I chose you to be my friend and to live a life that bears good fruit because you are my friend. Don't ever think you have to do it all by yourself. You don't and I don't. He's there always as the best of friends, as real friends always are. They're there for each other. So as you finish today, I'd ask you to do just one thing. In your prayer, thank him for choosing you to be his friend. Simply ask, Lord, help me to be the best friend to you I can be. So again, thank you for spending the day here with us. God loves you for it, and God will bless you for it. So thanks again.